Okay, welcome back to Econ 104, Introduction to Macroeconomics. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at how we actually enact monetary policy. So really, this is just a part two of our monetary policy in Canada. First video was getting too long, so we wanted to cut it up into two parts just to be able to give you guys a break. In that previous video, we took a look at the mechanics as to how monetary policy is implemented. We took a look at the liquidity preference framework. We took a look at our market for settlement balances, our overnight interest rate, and kind of all of those tools that the central bank has at their disposal, as well as their mandate of targeting inflation at that 2% level. In this video, we're actually going to get at the full picture of it all, the actual enacting of monetary policy, how the Bank of Canada does it, the impacts it has on our greater economy, and then we'll wrap up with a brief kind of discussion or rather look at kind of some arguments that exist as to the pros and the cons of having an independent central bank. That is of having a central bank that is separated arm's length from the current sitting government. So let's go jump over and let's take a look at how we enact monetary policy. So let's bring this all together then. We've taken a look at the market for settlement balances. We've taken a look at this overnight interest rate and this basis that, hey, this overnight interest rates really are risk-free rate, our most risk-free rate that exists. And then we saw the spread between, okay, our bank rate and our deposit rate and how the Bank of Canada utilizes this. We've looked at our liquidity preference framework. We've seen how open market operations move through. And then finally, well, rather the first thing we kind of looked at, I'm just working through this in reverse order, is, hey, how by changing our money supply, we got our monetary transmission mechanism and the like. I shouldn't say finally, here we go. What we started everything off with, this is where we really wanted to get to, is saying, hey, look, we've taken a look at fiscal policy, and we took a look at, okay, by using fiscal policy, government increasing their expenditure or decreasing their tax rate, they pushed up aggregate demand, and we said, hey, Fiscal policy typically focused on our horizontal axes, focused on output. Monetary policy, not an entirety, right? There's actually many facets to the Bank of Canada. There's many things that they're interested in, but their primary mandate, their primary goal for engaging in monetary policy is in order to target growth and price level. That is in order to target inflation. And that is their primary interest is on this vertical axis. So let's go back to talking about this scenario here and let's take a look at what would happen through a monetary policy perspective in this sense. And so that is right to refresh ourselves is what was happening. Government increased of expenditure, decreased taxation. All of this stimulated the aggregate demand curve, caused us to have a temporary inflationary output gap. We then had our natural adjustment process. This natural adjustment process then created farther inflationary pressure, bringing us price level up, price level up, back towards equilibrium. So let's back it up. Let's say that we are at just at this point here where the government has engaged in fiscal policy and they have caused this initial little burst of inflation and we're still kind of like dealing with this short run adjustment to this point and we're wondering how this is going to work about if this farther inflationary pressure through our long run adjustment process. So for now let's just get rid of that bit there and we'll pretend we're in just we're just in the process of doing our short run adjustment to this short run macroeconomic equilibrium in this inflationary output gap. This natural adjustment process has not yet occurred. Okay, let's go back and let's go see how this is looked at, how this is viewed from the Bank of Canada's perspective and what they would want to do in order to deal with this. So let's go jump and take a look at that. And just so we can keep it in mind, let's quickly just take, uh, make a little mini version of what we were just looking at over there. So of course we had our price level, we had real GDP, downward sloping, we had our aggregate demand, upward sloping, we had our aggregate supply. And where that gave us was our short run macroeconomic equilibrium of Y prime and our price level. And we'll say that that was our 
right? Inflated price are Y prime one. And that was Y prime one, because keep in mind, this was post our fiscal policy. Initially, we started off at our long run equilibrium. Long run aggregate supply, that was our potential GDP. And we had initially, if we remember, right, this whole thing was caused by our aggregate demand shock to the right. And so we started off at our initial price level. Let's use the right tool. That's right, 100. So we've already witnessed an initial bit of inflation. This initial bit of inflation due to that fiscal policy pushing, pushing our aggregate demand curve towards the right. Okay. So that was our initial story. That's what we were just looking at in the pack. And then, of course, I was like, hey, actually, let's redraw this. And then I re-explained it. So, okay, there we go. That's where we're at. Now, okay, government, they have their own political agenda that they're trying to achieve. The Bank of Canada, they have their mandate. And keep in mind that mandate of the Bank in Canada is to target inflation at right or at symbol right like your shift two on your keyboard um i know it doesn't look like that at two percent plus or minus one percent right that's their mandate that's why they exist this is what they have been instructed by the government this has been their role their reason for existence this is like the performance review of the governor of the bank of canada like if they cannot hit this the minister of finance is like hey governor this was your one job you're not doing a great job. Maybe we need to replace you. So they've been given this target. Maybe this target, right? This gets renewed every five years. Maybe this was a previous government that renewed this target. But still, this is the Bank of Canada's reason for existence in this sense. So Bank of Canada is looking at this. And they're going, oh, wow. We've just had price level increase. We are having inflationary <clears throat> pressures. And what the Bank of Canada would be doing, they would have these actually massive econometric models taking a look at what the current economy is sitting at for GDP, what the current price level is sitting at. They would work in, okay, what are the shocks or the events that have hit our economy? And they'd say, okay, government just increased expenditure by a whole bunch or cut taxes by a whole bunch. That would all go into their model. And what this model would do is it would forecast... And it would actually forecast really one to two years in advance, right? So trying to look into the future saying, okay, given the information we have now, if given what we have now is forecasted into the future and everything really is kind of keeps on the same path that it's on, what is our price level looking like in a year or two? That is, hey, today our inflation rate might be 2%. But what the Bank of Canada is saying is they're saying, what is our expected inflation in one to two years? What do we expect that to be given what we're witnessing, right? And we can kind of look at through our model, right? There's just a very simple model, very simple compared to what the Bank of Canada is working with. We said, okay, hey, if we did nothing, if we just left things be, well, hey, we have this inflationary output gap, output above potential, unemployment below natural rate. All of this, you want to put upward pressure on wages, right? Low unemployment puts high pressure on wages. High pressure on wages would cause the aggregate supply to shift to the left. As the aggregate supply shifts to the left, we could imagine, right? Shift to the left, shift to the left. There we go. All the while, that's putting farther pressure on prices, farther inflationary pressure. So we'd imagine, okay, the Bank of Canada's modeling process is saying, hey, you know what? If we just did nothing, if we just sat back and watched, inflation, expected inflation will increase beyond this 2% level, right? That is maybe our expected inflation is going to approach that 3% bound or maybe even exceed it. Either way, Inflation is expected to exceed its target of 2% towards or exceeding its bound. 
Bank of Canada needs to act. Bank of Canada needs to do something in order to get this inflationary pressure under control in order to bring this inflationary pressure back down to its 2% level. And what exactly is that? What exactly does the Bank of Canada look at doing? Well, let's take a look. Let's just clean that up a little bit. There we go. Okay. So in this case here, Bank of Canada needs to get inflation under control in order to decrease inflation. We will engage in contractionary monetary policy. And that contractionary policy, the whole goal of it is to get the expected inflation in the future to fall. And that is we want to get that expected inflation rate to fall so that it's back on target such that prices are only increasing at 2% annually. So how do we engage in this contractionary monetary policy? Well, contractionary monetary policy, keep in mind, ultimately, what's the Bank of Canada's tool? Ultimately, their tool is to change the interest rate. And as they change the interest rate, that goes through its whole monetary transmission mechanism. We'll go through that whole detailed process again as we explain it to affect a change in our aggregate demand. And so if we take a look at that, if we take a look at that all else constant, we said interest rate went up. That caused, through our monetary transmission mechanism, aggregate demand to go to the left. We also said interest rate down. That caused the aggregate demand curve to go to the right. Right, and as that happened, well, here let's just let's just view it. Right, we have we have the graph right there. Let's utilize it. So okay, let's talk to the first one. Interest rate up. Let's do uh, let's do blue for this, just because I have blue selected already. Interest rate up. Aggregate demand to the left. So aggregate demand to the left. That would give us something like this. I'm doing it big and bold, so it really pops that it's different. What is our effect? We move from that equilibrium to that equilibrium. So, hey, that is going to be falling prices, falling GDP, all else constant. So, area demand to the left, GDP down, and price level down. If price levels are falling, that means inflation is falling. Alternatively, we could go GDP Sorry, interest rate down, aggregate demand to the right. If we go aggregate demand to the right, well, that brings us, oh, let's use the right tool so it actually looks pretty. That brings us something like that. Well, in relation to our starting point then, that's going to be prices up. That's going to be GDP up. So, okay. Aggregate demand to the right, that's real GDP climbing. That is price level climbing. That is inflation will be rising. And right, truthfully, this is expected future inflation. And it's only expected because, well, that's all we can do is we can expect. This is what would happen if everything else in the world stayed constant, right? That is, we didn't have any other shocks in our system. <clears throat> monetary policy and the effects of monetary policy were the only thing impacting the economy, then yes, if that was the case, we could make this statement about expected inflation. That expected inflation would fall. That expected inflation would rise. So, <clears throat> okay, our goal, right? Let's go back to our goal. What are we trying to do? We are trying to decrease the rate of inflation. In order to decrease the rate of inflation, so expected inflation to go down, we need this scenario, then our blue scenario, that is going to be our contractionary monetary policy, right? And the reason why it's contractionary monetary policy, and this messes a lot of people up, it's contractionary monetary policy because it contracts the aggregate demand curve. Now, why exactly does this mess a lot of people up? Because it contracts the aggregate demand curve, and the way we contract the aggregate demand curve is by increasing the interest rate. 
And that seems counterintuitive for many, right? It's like contractionary policy, expanding the interest rate. Ah, that's in conflict. Yeah, yeah, it is in conflict, right? At least terminology-wise, it's in conflict. Intuitively, as we work through our monetary transmission mechanism, it actually makes sense, right? And that's where we want to think about contractionary monetary policy, contraction of our aggregate demand. So let's walk through, talk through what's ending up to happen here as we go through this contractionary monetary policy. And let's, let's clean things up a little bit here. There we go. Okay, so we have our initial case there, again, before we're doing anything. So this is just due to the government's fiscal policy. We want to drop this expected level of inflation. And the way we're going to do that is essentially the Bank of Canada. This only happens eight times a year. And during these one of these eight announcements of what the upcoming interest rate is going to be, the Bank of Canada decides, hey, we have decided that inflation is going to be approaching its upper bound or maybe even exceeding its upper bound. So we need to get involved and we need to engage in this contractionary monetary policy. And we're going to increase the interest rate. Right, and that is this interest rate that they're increasing. They are increasing their overnight rate, their target rate. And let's just say that they're increasing this by plus, um, this is quite severe actually. This would be quite a severe change in monetary policy. They're gonna increase this overnight rate by 50 basis points. So keep in mind, we said that currently, as of this video at least, the target rate, I'll go I not target rate, was 0.25%. We then increase it by 25 basis points. We're gonna have I prime target rate then of 0.75%, right? So a 50 basis point increase in that interest rate. So what happens, right? What happens as we go through this? Well, we can take a look at it through either our market for settlement balances or our liquidity preference theory. Really, it's the same outcome no matter which one we look at. It's just going to be able to explain what exactly is happening. So let's take a look at our liquidity preference framework because our liquidity preference framework attaches nicely to our, well, to our monetary transmission mechanism. And then from that, we can work through to the impacts on the greater economy. So let's draw our liquidity preference framework. We have our two axes, of course. We're gonna have our vertical and our horizontal. We have our interest rate and our quantity of money. We have downward sloping being our money demand curve. So there we go, money demand curve. And upward sloping, we had our money supply. Okay, at this point here, we are going to have our initial interest rate, which is going to be 0.25%. Ah, that doesn't give me much room. Let me actually let me actually just fix that a little bit. Let's go and move our money supply that way a little bit. All right, we're starting at a pretty low interest rate. Let's show that on the graph. That was that was my mistake in that. So, okay, there we go. Starting off with this really low interest rate of 0.25%. And that's our initial one, right? We're there, we're happy, we're in equilibrium in our liquidity preference framework. Then the Bank of Canada makes their announcement. They decide, okay, we're going to increase our interest rate by plus 50 basis points. That is, we're going to increase it so that our new overnight rate is 0.75%, so almost a full percent now, right? But 0.75%, which throws us up like so. Okay, keep in mind that now at this new interest rate that we're targeting, we have a money demand, we have a money supply, and we have a disequilibrium right in fact market forces if just left to be market forces would just cause this interest rate would push this interest rate right back to what it used to be so as a result the bank of canada needs to make their announcement of their new interest rate and they need to reinforce this announcement 
right? And the way they reinforce this announcement is through their open market operations. So in order to kind of see what's going to be happening for our open market operations, let's work through what would be happening to our readjustment. Money supply is greater than money demand. So, okay, if that's the case, our story is we have more money than we have things that we want to buy. So, hey, we have excess money. What are we going to do with all that excess money? We're going to say that people want to buy bonds because they have more money available to them than they have things they want to buy at the current interest rate. Okay, so people want to buy bonds. They would try to be buying bonds, but nobody would be selling bonds. And because nobody's selling bonds, they begin to bid up the price. As they begin to bid up the price, the interest rate begins to fall, and we make our way back to the original interest rate there. Okay, Bank of Canada needs to prevent that from happening, right? Bank of Canada needs to prevent that from happening. What they need to ultimately do is cause this money supply to contract to our new equilibrium and so that is because everybody wants to buy bonds bank of canada will engage in an open market sale right they'll start taking their bonds that they have right locked up in their bank of canada vaults they will take their bonds and they're saying hey all of you guys want to buy bonds Cool, cool, you want to buy bonds, we're going to sell them to you. We're going to have all of these excess bonds and we're going to be the ones to sell them to you in order to maintain price, in order to maintain this new interest rate that we've established. So in that case there, they're going to sell bonds. So open market sale, sell bonds, Bank of Canada gets money. And this money that they get, well, they lock it up. They take it out of circulation. It's no longer floating around. If it's no longer floating around, money supply decreases. This is decreasing that monetary base. So these open market sale is selling bonds to the public, getting money, taking that money out of circulation to decrease our money supply altogether. So all of that happens. Interest rate is now reinforced. Interest rate is maintained at this new higher interest rate so okay interest rate has been increased and we now have this new higher one um what i'll do after this right we'll go through this example we'll take a look at the full monetary transmission mechanism talk about the little bits as to how this ends up impacting our greater macro economy and then i will go through this first part again from the perspective of our market from settlement balances. It's the same story, right? We'd still have to use an open market sale. It's just a bit of a different model to explain it. So just for the benefit there, I'll go through that again. Um, if when we get to that point, you're like, hey, you know, I'm good for that market for settlement balances, feel free to jump over, of course. But okay, what's happening here? Interest rates rose. So, okay, well, let's walk through our monetary transmission mechanism. Let's, let's write, write this down. This is important. Monetary transmission mechanism. What's happening? Interest rates rising. Okay, interest rates rising. What does that affect? First thing that impacts is real consumption. Okay, how does it affect our real consumption? You can think of this as two ways. First, higher interest rates, I'm more enticed to save. So if I'm more enticed to save, if I'm saving more, then that means less consumption because saving and consumption are flip sides of the same coin. So more saving, less consumption. The other way to think about it is higher interest rate. That's higher interest rate on loans. It's going to be more costly to debt finance your consumption. If it's more costly to debt finance your consumption, all that debt finance consumption becomes more expensive. You're not going to want to do it anymore your real consumption falls. So the two ways there. Using our whole new Keynesian theory that prices are a little bit sticky in our short run, that's going to mean that initially this increase in nominal interest rates is also an increase in real interest rates. Real interest rates going up, that's going to have the same kind of effect for businesses with their real investment. 
That is, right, higher real interest rate. It's going to be more costly to finance your big infrastructure projects, your decision, your decision to build a new factory, to buy all this new capital on credit. All of that just got more costly because of the higher rate, the higher interest rate you're paying on that loan. So as real interest rates go up, real investment goes down. Okay, let's talk about the capital flows. Capital flows. Okay, what's going on here? Well, this increase in the interest rate, you have to keep in mind that at the starting, we're always presuming we start off at equilibrium, and that is in equilibrium, we have this idea of interest rate parity. That is, hey, our risk-adjusted returns on Canadian bonds are identical to the U.S. bonds, the European bonds, the Chinese bonds, the Japanese bonds. Globally, all bonds, we could say, that kind of this interest rate domestic equals this interest rate foreign. That, hey, if you're an international saver, you're like, it doesn't really matter where I park my money right now because this interest rate is identical everywhere. Risk adjusted, right? The risk adjusted interest rate. Then what happens? Well, then what happens is that the Canadian interest rate goes up. So that is all of a sudden, hey, Canadian interest rate goes up, the price of Canadian bonds begins to fall as a result of that. So now all of a sudden, if you're an international saver and you're looking at where to park your money, you're getting a better yield to maturity from these Canadian bonds, right? Interest rate domestic for interest rate Canadian. You're getting a better yield to maturity from these guys as you are from the US, the European, the Chinese, the Japanese, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera bonds. So, if you're looking to park your money somewhere, this looks like the way to go. You want to invest, you want to save in Canadian bonds. So begin to buy Canadian bonds. Now the thing with this here is that Canadian bonds are priced in Canadian dollars. So to buy Canadian bonds, you first need to buy Canadian dollars. So Again, begin to buy Canadian bonds. It also means buying Canadian dollars. All else equal, this surge in demand to buy Canadian dollars will cause the Canadian dollar to appreciate, right? That is, the Canadian dollar begins to be worth more relative to foreign currencies. As the Canadian dollar goes up in value, well, that's going to impact relative prices, and thus it's going to impact our exports and our imports. As the Canadian dollar appreciates, Canadian dollar becomes to be worth more. That means Canadian things begin to become pricier. They begin to look more expensive. If Canadian stuff looks more expensive, foreigners don't want to buy as much. So our exports fall. At the same time, Canadian dollar appreciates, foreign stuff looks really cheap to us now because, hey, our dollar can buy more foreign currency. So our dollar looks really good, foreign stuff looks now relatively cheap, so our imports rise. All of this, well, let's break it up into its parts. Those two guys, consumption, investment, exports, all of that, that's autonomous expenditure. And all of that is falling. Imports, this is our marginal propensity to import, right? That was M in our Keynesian cross model. A bigger M means that our marginal propensity to spend is shrinking, getting flatter. So all of this in our Keynesian cross model has the impact of causing real GDP or a fixed price level to fall. Real GDP for a fixed price level to fall, well, okay, that there then translates into our aggregate demand model, and that is thus our aggregate demand shifting to the left. So, okay, this whole monetary transmission mechanism as we've seen it. What did we say? We said earlier when talking about this change in interest rates that as soon as the Bank of Canada makes this announcement, as soon as they announce, hey, we're going to be increasing our target rate from 0.25% to 0.75%, as soon as they make this announcement, it is minutes to hours before every interest rate in the economy updates. 
Okay, so these change quite rapidly. So interest rate, real interest rate, financial markets, again, very rapid change as to all this. Currency markets, very rapid change. So, okay, all of that starts to get change really, really fast. Consumption, investment, exports, imports, all of this actual goods market things, this takes longer. This takes longer for us to shift our behavior. We notice the change in interest rates quite rapidly. We're like, okay, wow, yeah, that changed. We notice the change in currency, the uh, change in exchange rates. That happens quite rapidly. But how we change our consumption, how we change our investment, how we change the amount of stuff we're exporting, importing, that takes time for us to react. That is from the time of that interest rate announcement to the time that we start to actually witness this change in aggregate demand. We would say that that there, that there, quite, quite a bit of time actually, that could be all together eight to 12 months. So eight to 12 months from that interest rate announcement before we have witnessed the full change in our expenditure. And so let's take a look at that with our model. Let's go back up, let's go back up here, all the way back up to this aggregate demand, aggregate supply model here. And we just went through all that and we said aggregate demand to the left. So let's go through that process. Let's say we go through that and our aggregate demand goes to the left. So keep in mind right now, we were having inflationary pressure up to 102. We don't want it to continue up, so we're taking our aggregate demand and we're causing it to shift to the left, back down to kind of this original equilibrium there of 100. Let's go like that there. Okay, and I'm just gonna erase this bit that's sticking out the end. There we go. Okay, so it has that impact of shifting our aggregate demand to the left. Actually, let, let me let me redraw this. Let me redraw this all together. So it had that effect of shifting our aggregate demand curve, aggregate demand one, shifting it to the left. And really, as we went through this whole process, for a fixed price level, right? Because keep in mind, let's go back down and take a look at that again. Change in autonomous, change in induced, causing a change in real GDP for a fixed price level, causing aggregate demand to shift to the left. That's again a change in GDP for a fixed price level. So that is, if we go all the way back up here, that is a change of aggregate demand from this original aggregate demand, this original Y prime, all the way down to this Y prime. Right, and keep in mind, in reality, we wouldn't do this drastic, right? We wouldn't want it to be this drastic of a shift because take a look at this. That would be from Y prime one all the way to Y prime two. And we'd say, okay, boom, that adjustment there, eight to 12 months from the time that we adjusted this interest rate. But okay, keep in mind, that's not our new short run equilibrium because what happens is we'd have our new short run adjustment we would have aggregate demand versus aggregate supply. Uh, we have way more stuff being supplied than currently demanded. So we begin to cut back our production. As we cut back our production, we begin to lower prices. So we move along our curves. Prices begin to fall, right? And that's a big thing. We begin to have downward pressure on prices offsetting this expected inflation. And we have our prices falling back to our new level, and as a result, GDP returning to where we finally want it. But okay, the big part there, the big part, eight to 12 months for us to affect these, these levels of output. Then once this output is affected, we then have this whole short run adjustment as we re-solve to a new short run equilibrium. This in itself takes time. And that is this price adjustment is a farther eight to 12 months. So, right, that is ultimately the Bank of Canada's target. They weren't overly interested. They are interested in output, but they're not overly interested in output. This is just a means to an end. This ends up causing this. 
And this change in price level, that is the change in inflation, is really what they're interested in, really what they're targeting. And so 8 to 12 months to affect the aggregate demand curve to change expenditure, and then a farther 8 to 12 months to affect the actual inflation, their actual target. That is, the Bank of Canada is acting really with a 16 to 24 month lead time. They need to be able to forecast, like I said, one to two years in advance to think about what expected inflation is going to be. And they need to enact their monetary policy because whatever they do today will not be felt in the economy in entirety for up to two years. So today's actions need a lot of lead time a lot of lead time for this entire monetary transmission mechanism to move from equilibrium to equilibrium. That whole bit takes time, so they need to act in advance, far in advance, right? And in that case, there, this is sometimes why we see the Bank of Canada doing well, relatively odd things, right? We might see that, we might see that current inflation is something like let's say 2.78 percent that is hey current inflation is approaching the upper bound but then the bank of canada does something bizarre they go and they actually decrease interest rates which hey decreasing interest rates that's expansionary monetary policy that is going to be causing the aggregate demand curve to go to the right, right? It would be the opposite story as what we just went through. And you're like, well, wait a minute, aggregate demand to the right, that's going to be eight to 12 months. And then aggregate demand goes to the right, that is real GDP increases, that is price level or inflation increases. Wait a minute, if inflation is increasing in another eight to 12 months, that's going to push us beyond our upper bound. Well, yeah, yeah, it might be pushing us beyond our upper bound, but maybe not. Maybe current modeling is that, yes, our current inflation is 2.78 because of some blip. Maybe forecasts are showing that over the next two years, expected inflation is going to fall to 0.5%. And if over the next two years, we have a pretty strong confidence that expected inflation is going to fall, even though current inflation is so high, if we're expecting inflation to fall quite drastically, hey, that's below our 1% minimum, we need to act today, even though it may seem counterintuitive, even though it may seem counterintuitive. Mind you, that's a rare phenomenon, right? Rarely do we see this kind of drastic swings in it. But just to kind of paint the picture that this may actually happen and occasionally, very rarely, but occasionally has. And that it can have this inverse kind of effect as to what we want, or as to what we witness, rather. Okay, as promised, I said I would go through this whole contractionary monetary policy rather than for this liquidity preference framework, rather go through it for our market for settlement balances. So let's take a look at that. Let's take a look at this market for settlement balances, and I'm just going to move to the right and do it over here. So drawing our market for settlement balances, what do we have? We have our interest rate, uh, and that's our overnight rate. We then have our quantity of reserves. We're going to have our current, uh, what do we have here? Our current interest rate. That's our target rate. So interest rate, target rate. And then we're going to go, okay, we're going to have 25 basis points lower. So I'm doing that purposely right at zero. That's our deposit rate. And then 25 basis points higher. Well, that guy right there, we're gonna say that's 25 basis points higher. That's my bank rate. So interest rate, bank rate. And there's a reason why I didn't go through this one as the first case because this guy, this guy gets ugly. So let's say we have our demand for reserves like this. Okay. So that's our demand. 
And then we have our supply of reserves. So our supply of reserves is vertical. Oh, let's try that again. We want to go right through the target rate for our equilibrium. Close enough. Giving us something like that. There we go. That should be, right, we can kind of uh, scribble a little bit and say right there, our equilibrium is right at our target rate. Okay, but then what happens? Well, what happens is the Bank of Canada updates their target rate from 0 0.25. Keep in mind, this is 25 basis points, so that's 0. That's 0 0.5. So they update their target rate from 0.25 all the way up to, we're going to go 0 0.75, right? This was a 50 basis points, 50 basis points increase. So Okay, as we've gone through that, let's update our bands, as it were, to start off. So as we update our bands, we have to start off here, this 0 0.75. That's my new target rate prime. In fact, as that's my new target rate prime, let's just get rid of our old one so it's not confusing. So we see that old target rate's gone. This here, what used to be my bank rate, well, that's 25 basis points less than my target rate. That's actually my new deposit rate. Uh, let's kind of keep our color coordination going on here. That's my interest rate deposit rate. So deposit rate. Uh, let's just, we have the tools. Let's just erase and write that deposit rate, right? Which means, again, this old deposit rate is gone. Is gone. Then... 25 basis points above our target rate is going to be our bank rate. So there we go. We're going to have our bank rate. So we've redrawn, we've redrawn our bands for the Bank of Canada here. And such that the 0.75, this is my overnight target rate right there. So we need to work out how do we get back to equilibrium, keeping in mind actually that a lot has changed. A lot has changed. Our curves actually don't even look like this anymore. What do you mean they don't look like that anymore? Well, they don't look like that anymore because, first of all, my... Let's get rid of that little guy there. That there isn't there anymore because my supply... My supply of reserves is now looking all the way up to my bank rate because if i have a higher bank rate now it's going to be this higher point begin before i start to borrow reserves right and that was the whole idea why this went and became horizontal at this point here because at that bank rate any reserves i need would just be borrowed going on to whatever point i need okay very similarly for my demand curve well my demand curve is no longer going all the way down there because i would never I would never actually have reserves at an interest rate below my deposit rate. I would just borrow, or sorry, I would just put them on deposit at the Bank of Canada, right? Demand deposit. So in this case here, I would just take my demand, and once it hits this deposit rate, it would again go horizontal across there. So that is, this bit here is gone. Let's just erase that. And same with that bit there. So my curves update because my band updates. But what we notice now is that given our current supply of reserves and given our current demand for reserves, we have an equilibrium which is right at this deposit rate. That is, uh, we're not actually operating within the band. We have way too many reserves existing altogether. We have way too much money sitting in our reserves. And so... As a result of this, no one wants to borrow this money, so we're just putting it all on deposit at the Bank of Canada. Bank of Canada doesn't like this, right? Bank of Canada doesn't like this and says, okay, hey guys, look, if you have way too much reserves, right, that's why the supply is so far to the right, if you have so much reserves, I'll take care of this from you. I will buy some of these. I will buy some of these reserves. And how do they buy these reserves? Well, they say, Bank of Canada, 
Bank of Canada says, I will sell you bonds and then in lieu of these bonds, I will give you those bonds and I will take some of your money. That money that they're taking is those reserves, of course. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Bank of Canada is going to sell bonds? What is that? Bank of Canada selling bonds? It is an open market sale. So, okay, as the Bank of Canada sells these bonds and takes the reserves, our amount of reserves begins to fall. As our amount of the supply of reserves begins to fall, it continues to until we wind up at, right, like that, and we obtain a new equilibrium in our market for settlement balances with this overnight exchange rate being really close to our actual target rate, ideally at that target rate. So right again, as with our typical stuff, we have that shift, we have the old one disappearing. Oops, I didn't mean to delete my demand curve. Let's try that again. Let's not delete the demand curve there. There we go. There we go. Demand, and then here we can get rid of that initial equilibrium point. Clean up the diagram a little bit. So we have how this would work through with our market for settlement balances. It looks a lot uglier dealing with changes in this market because we have so many lines going on. That's why I didn't do this one to start us off. But the big takeaway is that it's still the same process, right? It's still the Bank of Canada engaging in an open market sale. We're just thinking about it through a slightly different mindset, slightly different mind frame as to how the Bank of Canada deals with the financial institutions, financial intermediaries. From there, yeah, interest rate went up. Interest rate going up, our whole monetary transmission mechanism works the same. So we have all that process happening just the same as we would, just the same as we would have expected. Okay, so we see here what has happened. We see how the Bank of Canada uses monetary policy. We're through an example with contractionary monetary policy. I'm not necessarily going to explicitly go through an expansionary policy example because everything's the same. We just flip all the arrows around, right? It's symmetric. Everything's identical. We just work through it in the opposite way. What I do want to talk about, though, is a concept known as long-run neutrality of money. And that is this whole idea that in the long run, monetary policy is entirely neutral. There is no long run impact of monetary policy. The only long run impact of monetary policy is inflation. And I really want to I really want to paint this a clear picture because monetary policy always seems like such a powerful tool. We can change we can change our interest rates as we change our interest rates. It ends up impacting our economy as it impacts our economy. We can get these different outcomes. But what I really want to see in this is that it has no long run effect. And that is, let's suppose we're in this case, let's say this is like Canada pre-1991. So before we decided to engage in inflation targeting. So let's say we have our initial macroeconomic equilibrium here. We're going to start off in long run macroeconomic equilibrium. So aggregate demand. Aggregate supply, and then our long run aggregate supply curve. There we go. Long run aggregate supply. Such that to start off, we have Y star equal to Y prime. And of course, that means that we have our natural rate of unemployment equal to the actual rate of unemployment. At this point here, right, short run macroeconomic equilibrium, I'll do that in white. And we get our initial price level. Again, I'll give it just a notional number of 100. So we have our initial long run, short run equi equilibrium. We're all aligned, so we're in long run macroeconomic equilibrium. Everything's stable. We have no market forces acting any direction at all. Let's suppose we have this notion that, hey, we wanted right? Let's say, I don't know, Bank of Canada is underneath political influence or Bank of Canada has a different mandate such that the 
Bank of Canada is pushed to lower the interest rate. Maybe they're pushed to lower the interest rate for this idea of decreasing the unemployment, right? Maybe they have, instead of an inflation target, maybe they have an unemployment rate target and they want to keep the unemployment rate lower than the natural rate. Well, okay, so they want to lower the interest rate in order to do so. Maybe they want to keep some level of GDP. And right now, that level of actual GDP they want to witness is beyond potential GDP. So again, they could target that. Again, that would have to be, in order to get GDP to be above the potential rate, we would have to lower the interest rate. So, okay, that is, Bank of Canada is pushed to lower the interest rate. That is, they are pushed to engage in expansionary monetary policy. And okay, like I said, I'm not going to explicitly go through the entire monetary transmission mechanism in detail for this expansionary case. We went through the contractionary case. It's just all reversed signals, reversed arrows, right? So that's going to be interest rate lower. That causes consumption, investment, and exports to all rise. It causes imports to fall. All of that. All of that means that real GDP for a fixed price level is going to rise. That means that our aggregate demand curve for a fixed price level is going to shift to the right. Keeping in mind this whole interest rate to change in expenditure is 8 to 12 months. So, okay, what does that mean? For this fixed price level at least, oh, let's use the right tool there. For this fixed price level at least, aggregate demand has shifted to the right. Let's use a bigger, bolder line so we can really see that. There we go. That's our new aggregate demand one. And I could have rate shifted this, but I do just want to make it so that we can see it a little bit. So I'm just going to kind of shade this guy out a little bit just so that we can say, okay, we knew it was there. But as soon as it shifts, it is essentially gone. There we go. So it was there. We can kind of still see the dotted line as to where it was. But we're now dealing with this new aggregate demand. And that is for a fixed price level. We go from our initial equilibrium all the way to this point here. 8 to 12 months for that full horizontal shift of that aggregate demand curve. It's then going to take another 8 to 12 months for us to adjust to our short-run macroeconomic equilibrium. That is for price levels to adjust upwards to get to our short-run macroeconomic equilibrium such that we find ourselves in this inflationary output gap with this new higher price level. Ah, let's say it's a bit more. Let's say it's 102. And there we go. This is our new Y prime 1. And hey, at Y prime one, we're now going to have natural rate of unemployment. That's going to be greater than our actual unemployment, right? We're going to have low levels of unemployment. So actual unemployment is really low. We're in this inflationary output gap. Okay, so eight to 12 months for that big shift of the aggregate demand curve, another eight to 12 months for us to cycle through to our short run equilibrium. That is right, this guy here, this is another eight to 12 for that prices to rise. But okay, we're not done. We're in a short run equilibrium, such that this short run equilibrium is an inflationary, oh, that was fun inflationary output gap right we have y prime above y star we have u prime below u star that is actual output above potential unemployment below the natural that is all of this this pulled down unemployment rates low unemployment rates puts an excess demand on labor excess demand on labor begins to push up wages right keep in mind all that's happened is the bank of canada has held the interest rate low 
shifting our aggregate demand to the right, and then they're just, hey, there we go, there's a new aggregate demand, we're leaving it there. Okay, as that happens, wages, factor prices, now begin to rise because of this inflationary output gap causing excess demand on workers. So wages begin to rise. As wages begin to rise, this puts negative pressure on our production. Higher costs of production means we can't produce as much for a fixed price level. If we can't produce as much for a fixed price level, our aggregate supply curve begins to contract. And it will begin to contract, it will begin to shift to the left, and it will continue to shift to the left, working its way as such and we'll go aggregate supply prime. Again, keeping in mind, I didn't want to completely just shift it because I wanted to be able to refer back to the original one there. So let's just fade it out a little bit. There we go. Something like that. And we see that aggregate supply is shifted to the left. Now this here, this takes an indeterminate amount of time, right? We're pretty confident in that, hey, this monetary policy to shift the aggregate demand, eight to 12 months. Short run adjustment due to monetary policy, a further eight to 12 months. How long for this aggregate supply curve to shift to the left? That's an indeterminate amount of time. We're, we're not 100% we're not with that, right? There are of course estimates, but they, they, vary, they vary quite widely. Um, inflationary output gap, we could be looking at, yeah, eight to 18 months, somewhere maybe in that kind of time frame. But that, that number that I just quoted there, that, that's not gospel. That really does depend on our circumstances. So aggregate supply shifting to the left, giving us our new short run macroeconomic equilibrium. Well, where are we now? Well, that's gone, right? We're no longer at that short run macroeconomic equilibrium. We are now at this new one. Let's use white again for this guy. We are now right there, right there. What is the impact of that? Well, increase again in price level, we'll go to 104, but hey, what happened to actual output? We are right back to where we started with output equal to potential, with unemployment equal to the natural rate. That is, hey, we lowered the interest rate, we stimulated aggregate demand, in the short run, we got this big economic boom. In the short run, we saw unemployment rates fall. In the short run, we saw everything being great. But in the long run, what was the only impact of this monetary policy? The only long run impact of this monetary policy was an increase in price level. And that's what we mean by long run neutrality of money, is that in the long run, monetary policy has no impact on real output, has no impact on real economic variables. The only long run impact of monetary policy is inflation. That's going back to Milton Friedman, money everywhere and always is an inflationary phenomenon, right? So the only impact we've had, price levels go up. That's the only long run impact of money. And I know I've said that many, many times, it's because it's an important point to drive through. Right, is that egg, that uh, sorry, agreed man? I was looking at that. That monetary policy, it's a powerful tool for short run policy goals, no long run effect. The only long run effect we would ever witness in that is inflationary. Now, going back to why did we witness, and we've seen the graph a few times now, why did we witness the crazy rates of inflation of the 70s, of the 80s? Let's uh, let's bring that graph up, let's take a look at that guy again just so that we can look and talk about that. Okay, so here's our inflation again, going from 72 to 2015. What we witnessed, right, especially before 1991, let's use a color that actually will be able to be visible on there. Before 1991, we see that, hey, inflation rates were typically, especially in the late 70s, early 80s, close to 9, 8, 11% annually, and then, through the late 80s, they were more closer to our 5-ish, 5.5, 4% line. Still still quite high rates of inflation. What, what, was, what was the rationale for that? Why was that? Well, part of this is that many central banks around the world, the U.S. Fed included, they didn't have inflation targets. They had 
unemployment targets. And that is ideally, they wanted to target unemployment at full employment. So that is they wanted actual unemployment to equal our natural rate of unemployment. But here's the issue. Natural rate of unemployment, this of course changes based off of, well, okay, structural unemployment. How easy is it to retrain and access schooling? Frictional unemployment. How easy is it to find a new job? What technologies are there that assist this? Right, so this natural rate of unemployment is not constant because rates of structural unemployment change. Rates of frictional unemployment change. So as these change, so does our natural rate of unemployment. So what happens if we estimate this guy to be 5% and so we aim to target an unemployment rate of 5%. But what happens if we're wrong, right? What happens if we're wrong and we're targeting, okay, an actual rate of unemployment of 5%, but this guy here, this guy here is actually 6%. That is right? Because this is just an estimate. We don't actually know exactly what this natural rate of unemployment is. This is a guess. This is based off of our modeling as to what is frictional unemployment. What is structural unemployment? If we get it wrong, if we get it wrong, and even just this percent difference in estimate, well, that means now if we target at five, but actual is six, that means that our actual unemployment is less than our natural rate of unemployment. Hey, if that's the case, that means that output is actually above potential output. And that means that, okay, unemployment, low unemployment, that's excess demand for workers. Excess demand for workers is going to push upward pressure on wages. Upward pressure on wages, that's going to cause the, right, this whole cycle is going to continue and continue and continue as long as we're targeting this level of unemployment. We're going to keep stimulating the aggregate demand curve to the right. As we keep stimulating the aggregate demand curve to the right, we're going to keep putting upward pressure on wages. As we keep putting upward pressure on wages, they're going to shift to the left. Rinse, wash, repeat, rinse, wash, repeat. This is just going to create a vicious cycle of pushing inflation higher and higher and higher. The problem was that initially during this period is that we looked at this and we said, okay, we have these really high rates of inflation. What is causing this really high rate of inflation? Well, okay, we know today that this really high rate of inflation is caused by expansionary monetary policy. Expansionary policy. And that is this expansionary policy was done because we were holding unemployment rates too low. Expansionary policy holding unemployment rates too low caused the initial surge in price level due to aggregate demand shifting to the right. Right, we saw that there aggregate demand shifting to the right, first kind of input in our pushing up the price levels, first kind of input in this inflation. Second aspect was because of the expansionary policy, we had low rates of unemployment causing wages to climb. Wages climbing then caused aggregate supply to shift, which then caused farther inflationary pressures. So, okay, that's the actual mechanics of it. But what was thought at the time is we're witnessing inflation and we're witnessing rising wages. The primary thought was that it's these rising wages that's causing all this inflation. Wages, inflation, wages going up means that, hey, higher cost of production, so now higher prices. Hey, more increased wages, more increased prices, more increased wages, more increased prices. Prices go up, workers now demand higher wages, higher wages cause higher prices. It seems like a vicious circle. So what's the response to this? Clearly the response to this would be to stop wages from going up. And what we witnessed is kind of the, really it was we blamed this on unions. We said, hey, a lot of the unions, they're the ones pushing, they're giving their workers a lot of power to push up wages. If we can stop this union negotiating, if we can kind of disband unions or make it more difficult for unions to be able to push up wages, then we can stop this wage pressure. If we stop this wage pressure, we can stop this crazy inflation. And so we saw a bunch of unions being destroyed, right? This is, this is part of the story. This isn't the whole rise of the end of unions as it was that we witnessed a lot in the U.S., 
But this is definitely a big part of the story, a big part as to one of the contributing factors. This happened, wages began to stagnate, but we still kept witnessing inflation. Huh, maybe we were wrong. Maybe there was something else going on with this. And that something else that was going on with that was that we were still just using our expansionary monetary policy. We were still just pushing this aggregate demand, still causing this initial bit of inflation due to that. The only difference is we didn't have as much wage pressure afterwards. We just shrunk how much this aspect was, right? You can imagine this doesn't increase as much after the factor of the aggregate supply shift. So yes, wage push, cost push inflation is a thing. That's this causing that aggregate supply shift, but it was found that really truthfully, the big driver of this long run inflation, the big driver of that was this expansionary monetary policy. The printing of money, the increasing of our expansionary monetary policy, increasing of our money supply. And it turns out that yeah, wages, wages were a part of it, but they were actually a significantly smaller part of it than we first thought. And as a result, a lot of this initial kind of resistance towards increased wages and inflationary output gaps, this resistance towards unions was maybe unfounded, maybe unfounded, maybe uh, historically an error. Unfortunately, we're still dealing with today the consequences of that reduced rate of unionism. So a bit of historical, bit of historical perspective there. Of course, right, any historical perspective, keep in mind, there's always a biased aspect of it. There's always more than one side of that story. From my research, from what I've seen in it, it seems to be a fairly empirically shown side. You are, of course, going to get people who say, I don't fully believe in that. If it's something of interest for you, labor economics and the historical implications of that are an extremely interesting field, and I would strongly encourage you to look into that farther on your own as well. But an aspect of it for sure. Okay, so what have we looked at so far? Wow, we've looked at a lot of monetary policy. We have taken a look at first the mandate of the Bank of Canada. We have compared monetary and fiscal policy. We've looked at open market operations. We've looked at the difficulty of controlling the money supply. We have then looked at the idea of interest rate targeting, allowing that money supply to flow. That gets over that difficulty of controlling the money supply. In that interest rate targeting world, we took a look at our overnight rate, our bands, so the bank rate, target rate, and deposit rate, and we look, took a look at our market for our settlement balances. Through those, we took a look at how by targeting the interest rate, by changing our interest rate target, we could engage in monetary policy to achieve an inflation goal, and we took a look at how that works its way through using our monetary transmission mechanism using a contractionary monetary policy uh, example in that, in that process. We wrapped up here at the end to take a look at short run versus long run effects of monetary policy, saying, hey, in the short run, we can have impacts on output, wages, all of that. But the long run impact of money is just entirely inflation. There is no long run impact of monetary policy on real economic variables. On that note, we kind of took a look at the bit of the history of it, and we took a look at monetary policy before looking at unemployment rates and how that led to runaway inflation. Last thing I want to talk about, last thing I want to talk about is pros versus cons of having an independent central bank. So this here is a bit more of a political side of our discussion, more of a normative side of our discussion here, and we want to take a look at the pros versus the cons of central banking and primarily of having an independent central bank because okay we've had an independent central bank here in Canada for quite some time most of the developed world has an independent central bank interestingly enough a lot of these countries that don't have an independent central bank are prone to runaway inflation such as Venezuela so hey that's a pretty good pro right there to having an independent central bank but there definitely are people who do push that uh, maybe it's not a great idea. So first, let's talk about the pros. So pros of having an independent central bank is that it's separate from political influence. 
So, okay, why, why is this so important? Well, hey, like we just saw, monetary policy could be used to target unemployment, could be used to drop our levels of unemployment, and hey, that's very politically popular. So current government may have an interest to push down unemployment rates for political gains, but keep in mind that although you can push down the unemployment rate, the long-run impact of that is going to be strictly inflationary. If you continually hold that unemployment rate down, you're just going to be continually driving inflation higher and higher and higher, meaning sure you get low rates of unemployment, but you get runaway inflation, potentially into hyperinflation. That's problematic. That's bad. So a pro of having a central bank separated from political interference, separate from political influence, is that central bank's given its mandate and it's allowed to do it regardless of the current political party, regardless of the political agenda. On that note, this actually also helps politicians. It allows the central bank to be a whipping boy. And a whipping boy is exactly that. It's a boy that you whip. Um, this actually is a really old saying going back to um, really the um, nannies and the caretakers of princes in like royalty situations. Clearly, these caretakers of the prince were not allowed to use corporal punishment on the prince if the prince misbehaved. So instead, what the prince would have, the prince would have a whipping boy who would be somebody who was also in school with the prince, who was also being educated with the prince. And if the prince misbehaved, the whipping boy got beat, right? Seems rather cruel. It'd be terrible to be that whipping boy. But the idea was that the prince would have empathy and compassion and would change his behavior to stop the beatings to the whipping boy, right? Hopefully that was at least the whole idea of it. Well, same kind of idea is that the Bank of Canada gets to be the government's whipping boy. That is, the Bank of Canada has their mandate. The Bank of Canada can do their thing. And even if it's politically unpopular, it can be politically unpopular. This current sitting government can recognize that it's the right thing to do. And they can say, hey, sorry, Canadians, constituents, we would love to get involved. We would love to do politically the right thing. But sorry, Bank of Canada, that's outside of our arm's reach. We cannot influence them. They're the ones doing it. Those darn central bankers, they're just acting in their own interest and they create a big political narrative as to why central banking is evil. But really the rationale behind it is like, yes, central bankers, you're doing economic good, but we're going to make a political story so that we can blame you and still keep the votes. So from a political perspective, Often central banks can be used as whipping boys and right in the eyes of the constituents, and thus it helps politicians in that way as well. Finally, is that, right, I kind of hinted at this one here, is that because of the mandate, it really just allows economic stability. It provides economic stability, and that economic stability is actually a political win as well. And if, again, if it's not popular, if it's not what the politicians want, well then, hey, sure, we get economic stability and we can blame the Bank of Canada for the unpopular actions. Okay, what about the cons? Well, the cons, the bad things about this is that ultimately the big one is that we live in a democratic world. We live in a democratic society where we, the people, have a say over the things that influence our lives. And arguably, the central banks, central banking, is a huge influencer on our day-to-day -day life. Being able to change the interest rate, being able to enact policy that drastically changes the way that we can spend, drastically changes the way that we enact with the economy around us, is massive. And there's no way to hold the Bank of Canada to account. There is no accountability to, of the Bank of Canada to the electorate. Right. So, for example, let's say. Let's say the Bank of Canada decides to increase their interest rates. Right. So, boom, Bank of Canada increases their interest rates. Why would they do that? Well, OK, keep in mind, increasing interest rates, that's contractionary policy. So why would they engage in contractionary policy? It's because they believe inflation is rising. So, okay, let's think about this. Let's think about this from your perspective. You're just a lay person. You're just a person there. 
you're witnessing prices going up, right? This, this here is pretty unavoidable. We're witnessing this in the world around us all the time. And in the current point in time where we're filming this video, gas prices are going up drastically. Food prices are going up drastically. Many, many consumer goods are going up drastically. Lumber supplies have increased in like 100% year over year in their prices, right? That is, prices are actually increasing so drastically right now that this is very, very obvious in the world around us. So we witness this and we're going, wow, prices are increasing, right? So we're like, okay, this is, this is a bad thing. Prices are increasing. My wage is kind of staying stagnant right now. Prices responded first. I'm not happy. My real consumption is falling because of this. Okay, so, okay, my money's not going as far. Then the Bank of Canada gets involved and they engage in this contractionary policy and they increase the interest rate. Well, okay, that's going to get this under control. That's cool. In 8 to 20, so in, in, um, 16 to 24 months, prices will start to fall. But let's say, let's take a look at your mortgage, right? This is for many people, if not already, will be one of your biggest purchases, one of your biggest monthly expenditures in your day to day. So at the start, let's say that you have something like a $500,000 mortgage, right? Fairly cheap here in Victoria. You would be spending monthly at about a 2% interest rate you'd be spending monthly about $21.20 a month. Okay, so that's your big expenditure. All of these prices are going up. Inflation is going up. Your real consumption is going down. You're feeling poorer as a result of this. Then the Bank of Canada reacts to engage in their contractionary policy to get this inflation under control. They raise the interest rate, and they raise it quite drastically. As a result, the interest rate on your mortgage goes up to... 4%, right? So you still have this 500,000 and maybe you're like, hey, but I have a fixed rate mortgage. Yes, but you need to renew every five years. And if you renew in five years, that's when you get hit with that new interest rate. This 500,000 now at 4%, that's now going to be about 2640 a month. That is what? That's going to be an extra $520 a month that you now have to pay. So that is by the Bank of Canada in getting involved, by the Bank of Canada trying to combat inflation, by them trying to get this price level rise under control. What have they done? They have drastically increased the cost of your shelter, the cost of your housing, right? That's not going to be a big hit to you. Okay, but what about outside of that? Maybe you're retired. Maybe your housing's paid off. Maybe you're not paying this mortgage payment. Maybe you're a renter. Well, what does that mean for you in that sense? Well, let's look at it from your savings perspective. From your savings perspective, let's say, let's say you're getting close to retirement or let's say either way that you are saving a whole bunch of money and that you have it all squirreled away in bonds, right? If you're all squirreled away in bonds in this case and then the Bank of Canada goes and pushes up the interest rate, well, what happens to the price of all of these bonds in your portfolio, right? Maybe you had just a $100,000 bond portfolio. You were loving it. It was great. You were getting monthly interest payments, coupon payments from this. It was going good. $100,000 value of your portfolio. Interest rate goes up. Well, if the interest rate goes up, what happens to the present value of all those bonds? That is the price of all those bonds. They all go down. They all go down. Now, all of a sudden, your $100,000 bond portfolio is worth maybe $85,000. Oh, your savings were just decimated, right? The size of your portfolio just went down. Now, mind you, you're still getting the same coupon payment monthly, so that's great. But if you were hoping to liquidate these to retire, uh, you just took a big hit. So what we witness is that the Bank of Canada... Being an autonomous organization by acting contractionary monetary policy to get this inflation under control by acting underneath its mandate, it negatively affects people who are currently in debt. Negatively affects people who are currently not in debt, but saving. And they're entirely unaccountable, right? It's not like the electorate can get upset and be like, oh my goodness, the Bank of Canada just acted 
and has bankrupted me. The Bank of the Bank of Canada has just acted and ruined me financially. No, you have no recourse, right? The Bank of Canada has acted. And yes, in the long run, this is for our own economic stability. This is for our own economic good. But there's definite short run, definite short run implications, definite short run hurts of this and entirely unaccountable. So the big con, the big reason why people say the Bank of Canada should not be independent is because we live in this democratic world, because they have this ability to influence us so drastically, and thus there's this big call for them to be accountable for those actions. Should they be independent? Should they not be independent? Well, again, like I said, big area of debate. Honestly, looking at it, I fall into this part that, you know what, Bank of Canada should be independent. Yes, these situations suck. Yes, they're unfortunate. But the gains from separation from political influence, the gains of economic stability far outweigh the individual losses, right? And that's hard to see. It's always hard to see societal gains versus personal losses because societal gains always seem so ethereal where personal losses always seem so large and personal. So, but still, I would argue this is definitely, definitely a societal benefit on whole. Okay, so a lot gone through there. The last bit that we talked about will be on that last summary that I just gave was this last little bit on pros and cons of an independent central bank. If you have any questions at all about this video, any questions on monetary policy or how our Bank of Canada enacts monetary policy, please feel free to reach out to me. You can feel free to comment in the comment section below. You can drop a line through the D2L frequently asked questions, or of course, always feel free to shoot me an email. Thanks, until next time.